right, thank you everyone for attending today, for those who are in person especially, uh, but also everyone online, and uh, for the special M cubed REL joint seminar on a Friday, uh, before a holiday weekend too. So it's uh, great today to have Dr. June Song with us from uh, the University of Miami, CMAS, and also NOAA's Hurricane Research Division. And I would just like to say a few words of introduction for him, although many of you here know him. Uh, first of all, in 2000, he uh, got his bachelor's degree in a somewhat different field, naval architecture and ocean engineering at the Dalian University of Technology, which is in Northeast China. And then after that, we were very lucky and fortunate in the field of hurricanes that he got into the Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science uh, in atmos at the University of Miami. Uh, and that sealed the fate of boundary layer meteorology and hurricanes to come in a good way. And uh, that uh, I, in 2007, he got his PhD there. And uh, s during that time and since then, uh, he's done a wide variety of research studies in all kinds of different areas. Uh, some of the more prominent areas is air-sea interaction interface uh, with the exchange coefficients and uh, observations of the boundary layer, very detailed studies that have transformed our understanding of uh, boundary layer, which impacts the entire hurricane system, of course. And uh, so another interesting fact about June is he's flown in over 40 hurricane missions in the NOAA P3 and I think he'll be doing that again this season. Uh, he's been in several Cat 4 and 5 hurricanes, lots of war stories, so if you ever had a chance to talk to him about it, it's very intriguing. And uh, he's been a collaborator with NCAR scientists for uh, over a decade and continues to have really productive collaborations here. So it's really a joy to have him here today. And so I'll turn it over to him for his presentation on some of his work he's been doing recently. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chris, uh, for the nice introduction. I also I want to thank Chris for hosting me, uh, Ariel, and also George Brown and my man yeah, for inviting me to come here. Really appreciate. Uh, and also thank you all to come in to my, uh, my seminary in person this Friday on a long weekend. Also thank people online. So I'm going to uh, present some of my uh, uh, some work from a paper published this year is on the uh, mean uh, kinematic kinematic structure of a uh, kind of hurricane boundary and uh, its relationship with, uh, to intensity change. But uh, at the beginning, I'll show some uh, background, maybe too much, kind of like some some of my uh, work related to the modeling, and then uh, at the end, I'll show the, some of the observations. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators uh, listed here. So uh, if you. I think uh, in this audience, most people know hurricanes. If you're not familiar with hurricanes, uh, so here I'm showing you a, a schematic diagram of, of the uh, kind of cross section of uh, a tropical cyclone or hurricane. So it's essentially, you see at the center of a storm, for a stronger storm, there's, um, the wind is uh, weak and also the pressure is low. So we call it an eye, hurricane eye. Then uh, the strongest wind region uh, we, we call the eye wall, and also you, you see, usually if you look at a horizontal view of, of a satellite image of a storm, there's some cloud regions. Um, I mean, we call in the outer core region that we call it, uh, rain bands. So for a, a hurricane, is actually fueled by the ocean through latent heat release. It's kind of the um, uh, latent heat fluxes uh, are the um, energy to fuel a hurricane, and then the energy will be released near the um, uh, in the eye region through the um, uh, uh, condensation, and then also some of the energy exhausted near the outer flow region near the uh, the top of the chopper pose. So here, uh, the, the equation here, I'm taking from um, uh, Professor Harry Emanuel's paper. So this is the, uh, the famous uh, MPI theory, maximum uh, product intensity theory. So basically, the, the, the square of the maximum intensity is actually related to um, CK over CD. Uh, and CK and CD are the exchange coefficients for enthalpy and the momentum transfer, respectively. And TS here is the sea surface temp temperature. Uh, yeah, T0 is the outer flow temperature. And then the K here is the moist um, uh, enthalpy or entropy. In, uh, so K0 is, it, is the, the enthalpy at the sea surface, and K is, is the enthalpy in the boundary layer. So you can, fr just from this equation, you can see 
ARC interaction or um, under transfer in the low levels uh, definitely uh, relates to the maximum intensity is important for, for hurricane uh, intensification or intensity. And now the, the right hand figure shows um, this plot is of Brian Towns paper is show, showing that um, some of the uh, the pro, uh, kind of environment uh, the, the effect of the environmental shear on the uh, the overall vortex scale structure usually in, for shear storm is tilted. Uh, you're really down shear. Here the, the arrow here shows the shear direction. And then uh, you see the clouds, the eye wall rig, are, uh, because of the vortex tilted, those come back down draft, bringing down dry and cool air into the boundary layer. So that usually those cool and dry air would um, weak, weaken the storm. This kind of like low level ventilation, but then because we have the surface fluxes, anthropic fluxes would moistening, moisten and uh, warm the air of these uh, fluxes, the, so-called a boundary recovery. So that would, um, this kind of a com competing effect, this downdraft bring low entropy air, but the fluxes would uh, uh, enhance the, uh, the, those, those anthropy entropy. So that is connected to the hurricane intensification. So I, I'm said, I mentioned uh, here several uh, papers, some theoretical, some modeling or, or uh, observations. So, uh, so in the, I mean, in my uh, work, uh, in this talk, uh, I mostly focus on the boundary layer processes uh, sorry about this, a lot of words, but so why is the, uh, the boundary layer process um, so important for hurricane development? Uh, I'm citing some of the, the um, you know, the, the codes from Audra Smith and some others' uh, papers. So basically the boundary layer provides uh, the coupling between the primary and the secondary circulation. The primary circulation is kind of the, is the, um, in the northern uh, hemisphere, it's kind of cyclonical flow. And, and I'm gonna uh, talk about the secondary circulation later in, in one slide later. And then I mentioned about the air state fluxes energy uh, used to support hurricane development. So moisture basically enters a storm, you know, the, from the surface, you know, by um, kind of like a influenced by the boundary winds through the boundary to the, and supports the, uh, the upper level convection. And then the boundary dynamic, thermodynamics kind of determines the vertical transports uh, of ang angular momentum and moisture out of the, the boundary layer. So the, basically the mass exiting the, the, the boundary layer, that would be linked to the uh, deeper convection. And then also the, some of the, uh, the radio distribution of these quantities actually uh, have some constraints on the, um, the radio distribution of buoyancy and then in turn uh, the convection. So uh, just, um, uh, this is uh, the, uh, I wanna show you a paper uh, Lead by Joe Siang. Actually, the, so in this paper, we analyzed the about a 15 uh, year of buoy data. So, so in this study, um, uh, we look at the ARC, uh, in con ARC thermal contrast uh, from this buoy observation. On the, uh, the left hand side, show the buoy locations and the, the hurricane tracks. But then on the right side, it, uh, the uh, the the y axis is the uh, ARC thermal contrast. The SST. Sea surface temperature minus 10, 10 meter temperature, and also the the air sea uh, humidity contrast Q S S D minus Q ten. So uh, we compared the uh, the radio distribution of these two quantities for intensifying and the weakening storms. So you see, for intensifying storm has to be um, for six hour intense change has to be greater than ten knots. Uh, for weakening case, uh, six hour intense change has to be uh, less than uh, yeah minor kind of like a kind of the weakening has to be uh, larger than 10 knots too. So you can see the, in terms of the temperature difference, there's not much dif difference between intensifying and weakening cases, but if you look at the air sea humidity contrast. So there's um, the, for the intensifying case, this uh, air sea humidity contrast is actually about near the eye wall is about 27% larger. And this is uh, statistically significant uh, at uh, confidence level 99%. So this is uh, again essentially taught telling us, you know, these uh, air sea processes are important for hurricane uh, intensification. Um, I mentioned about the boundary layer, so uh, I wanna, here's the kind of a schematic diagram from uh, my paper, kind of based on uh, thousands of drop sounds, composites. So in hurricanes, where's the top of the boundary layer? So there are different type of boundary layer height scales. So for instance, uh, and, and we found that actually the, the thermodynamic boundary layer and the kinematic boundary layer is separated. So ZI is, is the traditional thermodynamic mixed layer. And here the H inflow is the, the top of the inflow layer. 
and then h v max is the height of the maximum wind speed. So basically, we found the, the kinematic boundary layer top is actually much higher than this thermodynamic mix layer. But in the in some of the uh, boundary layer outside hurricanes, um, mostly the, the thermodynamic boundary layer could be uh, similar to the kinematic boundary height. So this is uh, so, and also the you see this boundary height also uh, decreases uh, toward the storm center. So in the ultra cold region, the boundary layer is deeper, and near the eye wall, it's uh, shallower. So this is kind of related to the dynamical scaling. Um, and so next, uh, I, I mentioned about um, primary and uh, secondary circulation. So this is uh, I took this slide from Roger Smith actually. So basically, above the boundary layer in the free atmosphere, usually the is in uh, gradient balance. Uh, basically, the pressure gradient here ba is balanced by these cent uh, centrifugal force, uh, Coriolis force, and the pressure they're balanced above the boundary layer. But but within the boundary, because of the the surface friction, so be the V here is the tangential wind. Because of the surface friction, so uh, that's reduced the V component. So that that then that's um, the reduce this centrifugal force and also Coriolis force, so that the pressure gradient is actually larger than the combination of the other two other forces. So the net A gradient force will create this inflow. So so basically here, th that's kind of the secondary circulation. So basically, th as the air rotates diagonally, it also moves inward toward the storm center. And by the time it the eye wall, it's rise. And then uh, near the top of the boundary layer, it's kind of the outflow. Um, so, so that's we call the secondary circulation. Uh, so this A gradient force, uh, it's very important actually in terms of the hurricane spin up dynamics. So, so because it drives the inflow and the inflow will add back um, angular momentum uh, that helps spin up the, the vortex. Uh, I mentioned about turbulent mixing. So I want to, um, I mean, although my, my, the focus of this talk or my paper for the radar study is kind of on the mean structure, not turbulent. So I want to sh uh, show you some, you know, the, in terms of the scales of the turbulent eddies because one of the turbulent mixing is important. So this is the, the, the figure from uh, George Brand's paper, actually. I'm a co-author. So, so this one, um, uh, what I'm showing you here is the spectrum of the alignment components, SU here, and then as a function of frequency. So basically, if you integrate this, uh, uh, the spectrum along this frequency, you get basically the turbulence energy. Is the, uh, the TKE is kind of U prime square plus V prime square. So integrate this. Um, for the U components is kind of the variance of the, the alignment components. But, and, and this, um, you see the color lines, uh, yellow, uh, red, blue, are the, from the RES simulations. And the observation is from the Sableas experiment. Uh, we collected a, in the older days, not in the 2003, actually, we flew the main aircraft down to 100 meters in the category five hurricane. So, so that's the data, is real data. And then you can see the, um, so, so the, this black dashed line shows the inertial subrange. So within the inertial subrange, uh, usually the shear protection is balanced by dissipation. So you can see that this area is model running up to uh, eight meters. So ca basically can resolve the, this inertial subrange. But again, you can see the, at the higher frequency, small scale uh, uh, range, they still like, um, uh, they fell down. That means they, they couldn't resolve the turbine eddies even with eight, kilometer, eight meter resolution, couldn't resolve all these small scale, I mean, the energy from the small scale eddies. So, so that essentially tells us that, you know, we needed to, we have to parameterize these turbulent processes in the, like uh, h wharf or some of the, you know, even with one kilometer resolution model, that's why we need a, this turbulence parameterization because this model couldn't resolve all these, all scales of turbulent eddies that contribute to the, uh, the total, uh, Turbulent energy. So he, yeah. So I, I put a vertical lines that shows the horizontal scales. It's kind of estimate based on you know you uh, the aircraft speed divided by by the uh, by the frequency. So um, so in the uh, yeah. So in the NW models, even in the operational H wharf is retiring or half. So we, we have to do um, turbulence parameterizations. So essentially the flux. There's different types of uh, turbulence parameterizations. So this is a uh, there, uh, they, uh, this is a kind of ID diffusivity type of boundary scheme was used in H-Wharf 
uh, later on they upgrade to, uh, to a, they added a mass flux components, but essentially the, is the still the additive festivity type of parameterization linking the, the fluxes uh, by using this vertical additive activity to the vertical uh, gradient of some of the mean parameters. So, so you see this additive activity has a, per, uh, sh a vertical uh, distribution like this, uh, following the paper of, uh, this is from uh, Obran 1970 paper. So in HWARF, so we try to uh, tune or uh, upgrade this, this KM parameter based on observations and uh, I'll, I'll show some uh, uh, results next. And there's another type of scheme is the TKE scheme. The TKE scheme also, I mean, also, um, the TKE scheme is kind of using the mixing lens and TKE here to parameterize this vertical activity. And then the, there's several um, parameterizations in terms of the mixing lens, L here. You know, the, the, this is kind of the recent uh, scheme is the TKE EDMF scheme. So all these scheme, schemes are People are making them more complicated. <laughs> so basically, it used to be Miller Yamada scheme, kind of the uh, 1.5 order uh, closure, but then they try to add uh, the mass flux components. So there's still ongoing research on you know how and why this mass flux component would affect you know the uh, turbulence distribution. So I I I didn't study much of the TKE uh, scheme. I, I think the the but I, my work mostly focused on this. Um, this uh, K-profile method uh, scheme. Uh, so, so in H, I mentioned, so in HWARF, so we try to um, upgrade this uh, vertical additivity based on observations. Uh, this is one example um, from one of my papers. So, so we were trying to look into uh, how the vertical uh, diffusion would affect the rapid intensification forecasts and also as well as intensity forecasts. So this is a so um, this is a quantification in terms of the critical success index, kind of like a looking at the probability de detection as well of a false alarm rate, and then it gives a total score. So when we um, modified the, um, the vertical diffusivity in HWARF based on observations, we actually um, increase this uh, successful index, so kind of like improve the RI forecast. We don't, for this, this test, we only looked at uh, 55 uh, cases, this, this 55 forecast. I mean the, and also we try to understand the why the some of the some did um, RI, some didn't. Uh, just um, uh, just with, uh, I mean the because of this change of the vertical additivity. So I mean this is kind of an example in terms of uh, trying to understand why um, when we change this vertical turbulent mixing strength would affect uh, the hurricane intensity change. Uh, this is uh, so. Uh, so I, I this this is um, so, so I took two runs. I mean the you see the right one is the one with the change of vertical activity based on observation. I mean this is a perfect case. I chose this so basically, and then you see the the, the blue line here is the case without before the change. But 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 in in those in my um, uh, two sets of H four forecast, there's only oh, there's only one change. Everything the same. Initial condition boundary. Condition only change the vertical divisivity. But you see that then we look at the, I mean, for this to run, you can see the by about 40, 50, four hour um, of lead time, the, there's a bifurcation of the intensity. So you see the, the for the low cam case, it keep intensifying and did RI, while the, uh, the high cam case actually did a, a slowly weakening. So we look, we, we, try, we did a, a, a absolute angular momentum budget here are the equations and the absolute angular public budget. So the left side is a tendency term, and the 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 first two terms on the right hand side are the mean uh, horizontal and the vertical direction of m, and then the the third and fourth term are the eddy direction of uh, of m, and then the last term is kind of the frictional term. Uh, so, um, but you can see that um, for this uh, at this bifurcation point, uh, we do see some positive. Uh, tendency of M uh, for the low cam case compared near the eye wall, so the black line is the, the, uh, the radius of maximum wind speed um, as a function of height. So you can see the positive um, tendency, that means the storm intensifying faster. And then the, um, then and, and we can see that when we uh, change the vertical diffusivity, the total mean direction is enhanced uh, in the low cam case. Also the friction is higher, but the overall tendency is um, 
uh, is more positive for the low, local MPs. The changing the vertical ID visibility doesn't change much of this um, ID, ID term. ID is, mo is mainly uh, influenced this mean ID direction. So that's gonna, we try to understand why uh, the changes in the model would, um, um, if it you know, dynamically makes sense or not, yeah. And also the, so, and then I did a kind of like a review um, uh, paper. So basically, you know, in the, the operational model, like H work is keep ch is changing every year. Look, you know, like for, so even for the PBL scheme, so here you see I, I put a PBL 11, 12, 15, those are the years. So you see there's many changes to this KM parameter or other, and also they, they also sometimes, you know, the latest version, they put a ED, the mass flux components. So you see the, but so, but the model, uh, when they do the model upgrades, they not only change the PBL scheme, so there's also other changes like a DA components, ocean coupling, microphysics. So, 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 but I want to understand, you know, how and why, if I only change this uh, boundary scheme, what, what, what would it do? So, so, so I run some idealized simulations, uh, everything the same, initial condition, boundary condition the same, but the only change is the, bound, is the PBL scheme, using the PBL scheme of that year. And I look at the, uh, the structure or, or intensification problem. So, so Levin says, says shows this time series of the, uh, actually at the mostly average maximum tangential wind, wind speed is one measure of the intensity. I know Rich and uh, George always use this. So you can see that, so basically, um, it's kind of confirmed some of the work I did, you, you know, just the, the two runs I showed before, so the real case studies. So basically, the, so this, this additive receivity not only influenced the, the maximum intensity, but also the intensification rate is pretty interesting. So, so you see the, the, uh, the PR11 is the most diffusive, it actually intensifies slowest. And when the, the PBL15 is the least diffusive, you see the storm intensifies faster. Then we, we look at um, different, um, you know, the, some dynamical terms like A grade enforcing, I, I mentioned. You can see that when we change the work of the diffusivity, uh, I look at the, the early spin up stage from 12 to 30 hours. So you can see the, the A grade enforce is definitely enhanced when we lower the, the uh, the additive receivity, and all as well, I, and then we also see the boundary convergence is larger, uh, the peak bound, boundary convergence, and also just look at the term, the radio adventure angular, angular momentum term is also larger. So that's kind of um, um, telling us that this uh, convergence angular momentum is enhanced in the boundary layer that helps spin up the vortex. Um, for the case study, we also look into, you know, when we change this uh, boundary structure in the low level structure, how would a, that change would affect the upper level structure, like the convective scale structure. So uh, here again, I'm looking at the onside of this, uh, at the bifurcation, um, six hour before this bif intensive bifurcation uh, point. Intense, uh, so I'm looking at the, so the upper panel shows the cons of the convective burst. So the convective burst here is defined at each grid point the vertical velocity has to be greater than three meters per second. So, so, and then I counted them, uh, the, here, the right hand, uh, axis and numbers, and also I, I counted the, the burst at different vertical levels. For instance, the, the, uh, the green color is below four kilometer. Uh, the blue color is between four and eight kilometer altitudes. And uh, the, uh, the red color is the, when the audit, uh, when the burst occurs at a audit higher than eight kilometers, those are the deep convection. So, so what we found is that there are a lot of more deep convection for, for the low KM case than the uh, high KM case. And also they are co-located with this larger diabetic heating. So it's kind of, in terms of balance dynamics, uh, people, I think some Wen Schubert's paper or even Dave Nolan's paper that, um, saying when this, uh, the deep convection, oh, also Jonathan Y. So the, the um, different local located with a higher internal stability uh, that would um, uh, enhance the diabetic heating and also basically uh, help intensify the, the vortex above the boundary layer through the bad, bad, oh yeah, and also the, the heating, if the heat is inside the RMW, right? If the heating is larger inside the RMW, it's co-located with higher internal stability, then that would enhance the, uh, spin up the vortex through balance dynamics. 
So basically, um, the point is, so, so, so this, we look, kind of look into the linkage with, between the boundary processes and the upper levels. So, I mean, they, they are essentially uh, connected. So when we change the boundary process, that also help um, um, link to the shallow and also deep connection. Um, and also, here's kind of like a schematic diagram. Um, we try to summarize how we change the vertical diffusion um, would impact the storm structure and also intensity. So basically, um, when we lower the vertical additivity, we, we got a stronger inflow near the radius of wind speed. And it's also this peak inflow is also closer to the center. So basically, and then also the enhanced outflow above the boundary and also enhanced the updraft immediately above the boundary. Uh, the, for the, um, the boundary is actually shallower in, in our models, so when, that's because of the physics change. But in real world, this may not be the case, actually. So, so but this is kind of the, how the changing the, the model physics would affect this boundary structure and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the upper level structure and in turn affects the, the, the storm intensity. So we argue that when we lower the vertical additivity, this, so the inflow is enhanced and that adds add more angular momentum that and, and basically offsets the surface friction, so helps speeding up the the uh, the vortex. Uh, oh yeah, hi Chris. Just a quick question for clarification: yeah. Is uh, some of this uh, feedback process where the pressure of the center of the storm gets stronger in the low di or low km case mm -hmm. and creates more strong inflow, or it, uh, would you say there's a kind of a connected or interconnected? feedback loop that keeps us going? Uh, nice question. So we, I didn't look into the, the pressure, you know, the much. I think, I think the, um, our explanation is kind of like the, through that uh, uh, radio um, wind tendency equation, uh, the momentum equation is kind of the, by changing this, uh, this um, the, the frictional term that affects the, uh, the, um, you know the the uh, aggregating force. So basically, the aggregating force is is changed. You know, the, um, so so that the tendency of the of the radio wind is changed. But I mean, that's a good maybe through the oh like. But the pressure gradient is also changed probably because the because the, the 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 pressure the central pressure is lower for the intensifying case. So that so the uh, the inward forcing is larger. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, this is kind of like, a, we also uh, look at the, uh, the horizontal diffusion um, effects on hurricane speed up following uh, George Brown Rich's work. Kind of, um, this is kind of, the, this is the idealized h work run. So the RH here, sorry, you may not be able to see, that's the horizontal mixing length. I would, so I did an angular momentum body to comparing two runs, one with the, the horizontal mixing length of around three kilometer the, oh, sorry. The other one is about 500 meters, and and one interesting finding is that the, the, this horizontal diffusion not only affects this mean um, mean advection of angular momentum, but also is very interesting. So so the, the when we lower the uh, horizontal diff uh, mixing length, actually this eddy uh, advection inside the RMW is enhanced. So basically that the horizontal diff the vertical diffusion mostly uh, influences that uh, mean advection, but the horizontal diffusion actually affects not only the mean advection, but also the the, uh, the eddy advection. So this, this this enhancement of this um, eddy advection, positive eddy advection, definitely helps spin up the vortex slightly inward of the RMW. So this is, I think, this is uh, one of the 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 new findings for this work. Um, so yeah. So next, I'm going to show the, the, the mean structure of the tropical cyclone boundary layer based on observations. So, so basically, I, I'm, I just kind of like give you a, kind of the review of how the boundary layer process is about turbulent mixing, horizontal mixing, how would it affect the boundary structure and also intensity change. That's kind of tuned versus the model physics. So, so what, what, what's going on in the real world? You know, like what are the structural differences? Is best, for this paper, we, we focus on kinematic structure. What are the structural differences of the boundary layer in, in the storms with different intensity change rate? So we look at the intensifying steady state, weakening cases, 
uh, based on observations. And also, uh, another question we try to address our study is how does the um, boundary structure vary with the vortex scale uh, structure, especially the vortex shape, and also the intensity change. So this is the, the paper published in uh, January, uh, working with Zhao, Paul, and uh, John Gamash. Um, so in this study, we used the uh, Doppler profile data. Um, so you may be familiar with the SWAS data. You know, the, the, um, this is the dual Doppler radar from P3 aircraft. So, so this, is the, this is the Hurricane Guillermo case from Robert Rogers' paper. So, so the, the upper panel shows the uh, total wind speed in the composite uh, sense from multiple um, uh, uh, passes. Maybe. So yeah, so here's the, the, the flight A to B is kind of the, uh, the, um, is the cross section with, uh, from, for the bottom two figures. So, so the, SWAS, the Doppler SWAS data has the vertical resolution of uh, 500 meters and the horizontal resolution two kilometers. Uh, but for the, but there's another data set, it's called profile data, that, that doesn't give you the, the uh, kind of like a, the, um, that really shows the vertical profile underneath the, the flights. It's like the you know, Raymond Leiter Eason <laughs> study. So there's like a, this is a give you the wind, you uh, uh, horizontal wind, the vertical wind, right below the, the aircraft. So, but this has a much higher resolution. The vertical resolution is 150 meters. So, it's, so basically I can get data down to 150 meter, meter above the sea surface. And also the horizontal resolution slightly higher is uh, 1.5 kilometers. So, so I, because I want to start, so the SWAS data kind of ends at 500 meters, so, but, but a lot of the process is, is kind of near the surface below that uh, altitude. So the profile data has that advantage for study the relatively low level structures. And uh, here's another example. This is from Rob Rogers' paper, 2012. He composited the, the storm, only for strong storms. So he compared the, this is the radio flow. So the cold color is inflow, warm color is uh, outflow. So he compared, this is the composites of multi cases. You can see the, the SWAS data and the, you know, the vertically, the lowest level 500 meters. And then the, you can see the, the profile that goes to 150 meters. And so you were, so the, because of the higher resolution, the profile data can um, measure the stronger inflow. You see the, generally the, the, the strongest inflow is close to the surface. So, I mean, you can also capture this outflow. The general structure is the same, but it just gave you a sense that uh, the difference between SWAS and uh, profile data. So, so in, in, in my study, so I analyzed the, the data from um, the cases from 1997 to 2019, uh, data from 140 flights. Um, and uh, the right-hand side shows the histogram of uh, the storm intensity. So, I mean, this database covers strong and weak storm. So we separated weak, strong storms when we do the composite because we want to get the, when we look at the intensity change problem, we want to make sure the intensity is similar so that the structure, so the structural differences uh, may be related to intensity change. And then we, we uh, group the data by intensity change rate. We basically, um, for this 12 hour intensity change, if, it's, um, uh, if the storm weakened more than 10 knots within um, 12 hour, we call it weakening case. The steady state is from minus five to five knots, and the intensity intensi band group uh, is for the cases with uh, 12 hour intensity larger than 10 knots. And the bottom shows the histogram of uh, the um, uh, radius of maximum wind speed. You can see on average, the storm has a um, the RMW of about 30 kilometers. And this, this is a horizontal view of all the legs, all, all the radio legs, there's a lot of flights. Um, so, uh, so the left is the earth relative, and the right is the shear relative. Because I plotted, um, look at the horizontal uh, map, because um, uh, from now on, the figures I'm gonna show is at the middle average. So we wanna make sure we don't miss, um, you know, the certain quadrants. But you can, it's interesting, you can see when we fly hurricanes, we always, Fly, you know, the, those uh, which all the, it's always like right to east and it's 45 degrees. You know, this is kind of by, by convenience. When we, it's always the north, north, um, north south, is, uh, and then the, with the 40 degree. But when I plot it in the shear relative or even slum relative, it's more evenly distributed. It's kind of like a double check. There's no, we didn't miss any quadrants when we do the, the, uh, the middle average. Um, 
And then from now, I'm going to show the composites of all this data in the azimuth. It's kind of azimuthally averaged um, fields. And also, I'm plotting the data as a functional height and radius normalized by the RMW. So in this way, we take into account of the storm size. So basically, we we we, um, we uh, group the data together uh, in this in the R over RMW and the height space. Uh, here, uh, I'm showing you. This is the tangential wind VT, VT. On the left side is the it um, is weak, weak group. So this so, so many information. Like the left hand side is for weak storms. Right hand side for strong storms. So basically, the weak storm is the category one and two, and the strong is three, four, five. Um, and uh, the upper panels are for the intensifying. Middle panel weak, uh, is for steady state. Bottom panel are the uh, weakening cases. So just look at the weak. I mean, they're, in terms of the tangential wind field, I mean, the general structure, they all look the same. You know, the near the MW, of course, we have the highest uh, tangential wind speed. And this black dash line shows the height of the maximum tangential wind, wind speed is one mirror of the boundary height. But we didn't see much differences between all these storms in terms of the height of VT max. But uh, one thing we noticed that the, for the steady state and weakening cases, the wind field is broader than the, you see there are more larger values of VT in the article region than intensifying case. That's, that's the only uh, main finding uh, in terms of the tangential wind. Uh, here, uh, the same, similar, uh, same as uh, the previous slides, but this is for the radio wind. Uh, again, left hand side weak case, right hand side strong cases, and then um, uh, comparing intensifying steady state and weakening cases. So the uh, firstly look at the um, the composite for weak storms. So you, oh, th this black line here shows the top of the inflow layer. Uh, that's be defined as the height of the uh, when when we are equals 10% of the peak inflow. And the black cross is height of the maximum tangential wind speed. You can see this, this boundary jet, basically. The boundary jet is always within the inflow layer. So the, the that's, and uh, for intensive, I mean, only for weak, weak storms, you see this outer core inflow layer is deeper for intensifying storms compared to uh, non-intensifying storms. Uh, one interesting finding, especially for strong storms, we noticed that, uh, so this peak the maximum radio inflow is actually closer to the RMW for intensifying cases. Well, you see there's some, actually the, 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 the there's some uh, enhancement of this radio flow uh, at two to three RMW. Um, the, the peak actually are located there for steady state and the weakening cases. And another thing we found is like, you see the, the outflow immediately above the boundary layer, it's concentrated uh, for intensifying cases, concentrated inside the RMW, but for the weakening and the steady state case, we do see some outflow region in the outer core. So there's like a, another secondary circulation. We suspect those may be related to rim bands or secondary eye wall. Um, and, oh, the, oh he, here's a, a, a study, I mean, my colleague did uh, using job sounds. So, so he looked at the um, 3,600 job sounds. It's just, he looked at the, only the surface, 10 meter inflow angle. So it's just, uh, with uh, just um, just for a very vacation point, I want to so just look at the D D panel. So this is the surface inflow angle as a function of R over MW. You can he look at the intensifying versus steady state case. It's actually uh, it's consistent with the Doppler radar data. You see that for the intensifying case, have larger inflow angle near near um, closer to the MW, while the uh, the steady state have much larger uh, inflow angle. At, in the outer core. So it's basically, subject, inflow angle is the um, arc tangent of uh, VR over VT. So it's, it's basically the tells the inflow strength. Yeah. This confirm near the, because our data, the radar data is, is the lowest level 150 meters. So but near the surface is also consistent. Yeah. And, and then uh, uh, here's the composites of uh, vertical, uh, vertical velocity. And, um, and you can see that the, um, and I'm also plotting the inflow layer depths for each cases. So uh, again, the left hand side weak case, right hand is the uh, the strong case. But one interesting thi uh, thing we found is that for intensifying storms, for both weak and uh, strong cases, you see the the convective activity is more located inside the MW. You know, there there much less convective activities um, 
outside of the MW. But if you look at these steady states and the weakening case, there's a lot of more positive uh, the areas of lar relatively large vertical velocity regions showing they're more uh, kind, uh, kind of like a, not updraft, but kind of positive, um, uh, convex I, I call it convective activity. Polarities are always correct. If you want to use vertical motion to be more accurate, so there's more com convection going on. That that's also consistent with the radio flow composites. So you see, there's more uh, outflow. So that's that's we suspect those are um, associated with ring bands or or secondary eye walls. So that means when there are more convective activities outside the the um, in the optical region, that actually it's not good for hurricane intensification. And then um, we look at the, um, if the vortex shape would uh, affect the boundary structure or intensity change. So I, uh, so here what I'm showing you is this, this tangential wind speed normalized by the maximum wind speed, just showing, just group them uh, to easy to realize the, the, uh, the radio decay rate of the wind profiles. So basically we look at the radio decay rates of the tangential winds and I select the top 30 and the bottom 30% of this decay rate. So basically uh, using the value of the, um, I mean basically the alpha parameter in one of the Malin's uh, et al. papers. So, so the, you can see the, the, so then I composited this uh, Doppler profile data for this uh, broad vortex, the blue cases, and also the, uh, the narrow vortex for the, um, the red cases. And the right hand side shows the Inertial stability parameter, uh, no, again normalized, but you can see as expected, so the broader vortex has larger um, inertial stability and uh, narrow vortex has smaller inertial stability. So it's, um, and, al and also I checked other parameters. Interestingly, so the, for these two groups, the mean intensity, there's no st statistically significant, uh, uh, it's not a significant difference. Um, significantly different actually. And also some other parameters like RMW, uh, SST, shear, shear direction, uh, mid-level um, humidity, they are, they are all similar, except the intensity change rate actually. So for this narrow vortex, the uh, average 12 hour intensity change is five knots, while the, the broad vortex is weakened by about 2.5 knots on average. And this difference is actually statistically significantly different, yeah. So, um, so basically, I think so th this tells us this uh, vortex shape actually is linked to the hurricane intensity change. This, at least from the composite uh, point of view, yeah. And then we, we, and then we just so basically for when we composite this uh, uh, the Doppler profile data based on the vortex shape, we we didn't um, um, consider you know the the intensity, but by luck the intensity is similar. But our previous composite when we Compose the the the, uh, the data by intensification rate. We separate by weak and strong cases to control the intensity. But here we didn't control it, but it's just like lucky. The 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 the, <laughs> the mean intensity is the same, and and uh, the uh, intensity rate is, uh, rate is actually different. So here's the composites of a tangential wind on the left, and um, uh, radio wind on the right. The upper panel shows the narrow vortex. Middle panel is the broad vortex. The bottom panel is the difference fields. And if you see the black, um, those uh, crosses, those are the regions where the difference is uh, statistically significantly different by 95% uh, confidence. Um, so, so um, I mean, look at the the tangential wind is kind of expected. You see the broad vortex definitely have broad, you know, regional VT. So this confirms our our composite te uh, technique. But if you look at the radio, the radio wind field is very interesting. You see the, actually the, the peak radio flow for in the narrow vortex is actually closer to the RMW. Well, for the broader vortex, the peak inflow is at uh, outer, in the outer core. It's about 2.5 to 3 uh, uh, R, R star, basically. And also the, the, uh, the, in terms of the outflow in the broader vortex, we do see there's a secondary Maximum in at um, R over RMW uh, equals is equal to 1.5. So you see, there's um, two two peaks of outflow. So the and also the, I mean this definitely near the RMW the inflow strength difference is is uh, significant. 
So, so yeah, so this kind of the side story of the, this paper. So recently, there's a paper by Smith and Montgomery. They, they, they try to comment or argue, you know, we try to comment on some previous papers because in the intuitively, in people's mind is that when, when the inner stability is larger, that would block the flow. So basically when the, in kind of in some papers, they cited kind of like a saying that, basically saying, oh, when the inner stability is larger, then the, then the inflow is weaker. So the, but actually our study found that it's about, you know, when for this broad vortex in the boundary layer, when the inner stability is larger, actually the, in the region, the inflow is stronger. So it's kind of, so kind of like refuting some of the intuition uh, in uh, kind of like the, the what's the word you know the, you know in the, the the thought model you know but so so they argue that uh, they um, in that um, the equation a radial momentum equation the there's no the inner stability not directly linked to the forcing so that's kind of their argument I think our work generally supported some of their their findings for Roger Smith and the Montgomery paper. This is kind of the, there's also, there's also the, some, uh, I, I, yeah, I should mention, so there's also, Jeff Kuypert has a paper, look at the, uh, the land scale, right? So basically the delta, the, the uh, updraft, uh, here, go back here. So basically he looked at the, the radial location of this peak updraft relative to the Arms W, delta R, he called. He said it's related to the ratio of inflow divided by inertial stability. So we, we, we try to, I mean, there's definitely a relationship, but we didn't find that delta R is a function of intensity change. So that, yeah, we commented in our paper too. It's kind of not related to the intensity gradient, yeah. So, uh, and here is the composite of vertic vertical velocity. Yeah, so you see the, the, uh, the upper panels are the, shows the composite of narrow vortex, the middle panel, the broader vortex. You see, again, it's interesting for the narrow vortex, most of the, com the, the strongest updrafts or, or uh, kinetic activity is, co is located inside the RMW, where you see more uh, convective activities in the, um, in the broad, in the optical region of the broader vortex. And also you see the, uh, the magnitude, the difference is actually statistically significantly different. We also look at the convergence or the convergence is stronger, the peak convergence in the narrow work is stronger uh, than the broad vortex. This kind of agreed with our modeling work, but our modeling work didn't see this radio, the difference in the radio distribution of peak inflow. You see, when we change the vertical added diffusivity or, or horizontal diffusion, the, mostly the strength of the inflow is near the MW, but the observations show that not only the strength is different, but also the, the radio location is different between the, uh, storms with different intensity change rate. So yeah, I, I still have some time. So, and then um, I look into some of the terms in this angular moment, uh, absolute angular momentum body because for the radar data, I can only calculate the mean at vacuum terms. I, I, I don't, I, because this is composite. So I use the composite to calculate the mean at a vacuum term. So the upper panel shows the, the angular momentum, just showing you for broader vortex, we have much larger angular momentum in the outer core, I mean, this as expected. So, so the bottom panel shows the total mean at action. Um, so you can see the, for narrow vortex, the peak value is located near the RMW. That's, uh, that's definitely supported the um, intensification near, over there, um, given that assuming the, the friction term are the same. You know, the, so, because we, 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 we couldn't estimate the friction term either. So it's kind of like, but um, because of the uh, mean intensity is similar between the two groups, we may assume if we assume the, fr the frequent term is similar, but, but definitely you can see the, in the narrow vortex, this mean net of action near them is much, the positive value is much larger. That means that it will spin up faster uh, for this narrow vortex, kind of consistent with the intensification rate. Uh, we also separated the, um, this mean net of action into uh, radio net of action, upper panels and uh, vertical at of action. The right panel show the difference field. So, so, I mean, you can see the total mean of action within the inflow layer is mainly contributed, the positive value is main, mainly contributed to the radio at of action. But above, above the inflow layer, so the, the vertical at of action uh, is dominates. Uh, also, the vertical at of action canceled some of the uh, negative contributions of the radio flow, the, the outflow to the uh, uh, tendency of uh, absolute angular momentum. So, so I mean, uh, just, uh, just I mean, basically the the radio wave action is the peak 
positive value is much larger in the near the amygdala for narrow vortex, but that is much larger in the ultra region for the broad vortex. To confirm, th confirm that. Uh, in the end, I want to show um, some schematic diagram uh, summarizing the or findings, kind of like comparing the the structure, the kinematic structure of the narrow vortex versus a broad vortex. So, I mean, uh, thanks to Robert Rogers, actually he, he, he made this plot actually, not me. Uh, so you can, I mean, um, just want to summarize, summarize, you see this peak inflow is located right outside the MW for narrow vortex, where the peak inflow is located in the ultra core region for the broad vortex. I know the boundary layer is actually deeper, slightly deeper for narrow vortex. This is uh, actually the, it's comfort, it's, you know, when we change the vertical additivity, so this actually we found the intensifying storm has a has a shallower boundary layer. That's purely due to the physics change. This, but, but in the real world, actually the intensifying storms tend to be have a deeper boundary layer. And you, and also the in terms of the updrafts or vertical motion, the strongest updraft is located uh, concentrated near the MW for narrow vortex, where they're more is they're broadly distributed. They're, they're secondary peak. Um, of this updraft in the outer core region of uh, the broad vortex. So, I mean, and also the, in, so we try to tie this um, result compared to some theoretical work uh, by Smith et al. So, so Smith and Montgomery, they have this uh, spin up theory. They argue that uh, uh, they have two mechanisms. One is the above the boundary is the, is the standard Oyama type of um, um, uh, the framework. It, Due to the balance dynamics, it's kind of convergent the angular momentum, uh, spin up the the uh, the vortex. But within the boundary, they argue that the boundary control, or because of this radial flow, it affects more angular momentum that compensates the radial friction so that enhance the boundary. Layer. So, so the the I mean, the, uh, generally, all results agree with that. Another component that re in the recent paper by Giroy et al. And also the Smith, they, they add a new component is in, in terms of the ventilation. So basically they argue that the, uh, not only we need this strong inflow near this eye wall region, but also, so this inflow will, will uh, drive air, uh, this, uh, due to secondary circulation, the, the mass axis boundary layer uh, has to be uh, basically smaller. So the convective induced the mass out of the boundary layer should, should be larger than the, then the boundary layer, you know, the the the, vert the low level convection due to the mass flux. So basically, the, the air has to be ventilated above the boundary so that this uh, there, there's some weak inflow immediately above this uh, boundary layer. So that helps spin up the upper level vortex. So our result kind of generally agree with that. So basically, in this for the narrow vortex, we have much stronger updraft. So that would help ventilate more mass out of the boundary layer um, for the narrow vortex than to the, than the broader vortex. Uh, that's pretty much what I have. Um, yeah, so, so I'll just quickly summarize for this uh, Doppler profile work. So, so we found that the info layer outside the eye water is deeper in intensifying storms than non-intensifying storms, and there are much less activity outside the eye wall region in the intensifying storms than in uh, non-intensifying storms. And also, the narrow vortex tends to intensify faster and also it has a slightly deeper inflow layer. Um, and the peak inflow is actually uh, located near the radius of maximum wind speed um, than in the broad vortex. And we try to link uh, this result to the presential, um, the max uh, ventilation mechanism uh, of some theoretical studies. And the future work will try to look at the asymmetric structure and how that links to the uh, intensity ch change. So I think, uh, yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. See if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I will take questions, both from the audience, and uh, we might have some on Slido as well. So I'll let Jesse uh, jump in if there's any. Welcome. Thanks, Jun. Um, actually, I met Jun in 2007 when he was a grad student. I was an undergrad in Miami. Yeah. Uh, so we go way back, 15 years, right? Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, for the data from your 2023 papers of the profile, the 
bulk profiles, the mean structure, if you were doing a comparison against HWARF, let's say the last model version, do you think the model would in, bul in a bulk sense produce the right boundary layer structure? Or would uh, the model still be biased? I mean, that's a good question. I, I, can't, I, mean, I haven't done the work, but I, I, I suspect there will be some uh, bias. I, I mean, the, especially that, um, you know, the radio location of this uh, peak inflow, mm -hmm. that's, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure they can capture that. Mm -hmm. Because, so the model needs to have really good skill in terms of forecasting secondary eyewall right. or ultra right. rimbands. Yeah. Other, I, I, I mean, the, in certain years, I think before 2015 or some year, they couldn't even see much secondary eyewall, I recall. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think some of the change in microphysics, okay, yeah, yeah they, they, they improved a little bit. And you think it's yeah. mostly in the physics and not mo model resolution you think is fine? And also in your condition, right? The, because okay, the initial, yeah. the model, right. can they okay, initialize yeah. this broad vortex? You know, the, right. Yeah. Okay. But, but so you think the mo there's still work to do for the modelers to I, I think so. <laughs> improve but, but just the, the I mean, my mean biases. Online, but, uh, first, <laughs> my personal opinion. <laughs> I, I, I believe you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, nice question. Thanks. I see on Slido we have a compliment on the talk by Gabrielle Labrador. Any other uh, questions? Uh, thank you, Jun. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the diffusivity you use to uh, uh, compare with the forecast data. So you make the low of the diffusivity, makes the KM low, right? Yeah. And improve the improve the uh, model uh, forecast compared to the observation data. So I think that's maybe linking with uh, wind shear. So uh, so what? Uh, so if the wind shear is larger, so the, the like hurricane structure cannot when it developed, it will be dissipating right pretty fast. But if the wind shear is uh, lower, so so the the, like the boundary layer structure would be pretty important that supports the updraft near the eye regions. So my question is, did you uh, consider uh, use the model simulation, or oh, did you use the model simulation with the lower, like the, you use the low cam, like the lower cam, what's the result uh, compared to the forecast data? Um, so I think that the first, so I um, computed the vertical diffusivity uh, using the direct flux measurements and mm -hmm. also the, um, so the, especially for my um, the 2012 paper, we, we did the two aircraft missions. So the 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 42 is flying up right above 43. So 43 is is flying in the boundary layer. They they have you know we have really good uh, instrument to collect 40 hertz data. We calculate fluxes. Well, well the upper level flight drop a drop sound. It's very close to the low level airplane, airplane actually. So using the drop sound data, I, cal I calculate the, you know, the work wind shear or directional wind shear, and then some other quantities. So that's how we, we compute the vertical uh, diffusivity. Oh. Yeah, that's how, how we do. But you, your second question is kind of like, a, I, I kind of showed a little bit. So, so in the model, um, so we kind of tune, I mean, for observation is really hard. Right? The, Near the eye wall, we only have one level. So we don't have much vertical level. So, so, in the, so basically, when we tune the model, we just we use the data at that level of the model. We kind of assume there's a linear relationship of additive receiving with wind speed. And then we, it's kind of may not be physical tuning. So, so honestly, so basically, we, we multiply by a, by a factor and to tune that uh, overall additive receivability to be matched the observations. And oh. then we, we make two sets of runs with the you know, before change and and after change, and then we look at the structural differences to understand the why the storm intensity and the structure are different. Oh, I understand. You yeah. you use the observation data to to calculate the diffusivity, then put it into the model like the forecast, which yeah. improve not the like the assuming a, a lower one. Yeah. Okay. So Thank you. So that's kind of what we did. But well, I mean the. Because the observation is, we don't have much of it, but that's why nowadays we try to do the uncrewed aircraft observations, mm -hmm. try to measure more fluxes, because it's so dangerous to fly a crewed aircraft to the boundary layer. Wow, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are approaching uh, noon. Uh, we might have time for one quick question. Otherwise, um, 
Anything on Slido? I do see some compliments on Slido, so uh, great talk, mm -hmm. thank which you. I agree with. All right, so let's thank our speaker. He'll be around to uh, talk afterwards.